<laughs> okay, so I I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, And since I will be, um, uh, I'll, I'll do the side slideshow, uh, I will not be able to see any chats and I'm also not good at doing both. So bear with me, I'll try my best uh, to, and I'm also minimizing all my windows. So I don't know who will be there. So please forgive me. Anyways, thank you everyone, my students, friends for coming to this talk on a Friday afternoon and a beautiful afternoon like today. Thank you, Professor Mancia for organizing these fabulous events for us. So I will begin uh, briefly by introducing the broad themes of my research. Uh, just, just a sec. Mm, yeah, so I'm a gender and social historian and I focus on everyday and the ordinary. So my work straddles uh, distinct but interrelated fields, women, domestic workers, children, fathers, masculinity, history of domesticity and family in colonial India. The common theme that runs through my research is my concern with everyday and the ordinary. My works emphasize that as principal forms of social organization and stratification, gender and family with their changing meanings and metaphors emerge at the crossroads of concurrent forces that are not divorced from statecraft or nationalist politics. I contend that as part of a global historical process comparable with Victorian and Edwardian England, domesticity became a motor of change in late 19th and early 20th century India. The new domestic culture in India that emerged as a part of a global movement grappled with ideas of a new home, a new woman, a new man, a new generation of children and of different ideals of femininity and masculinity. So my book, uh, which is, let me go back to the first slide. Uh, Fathers in a Motherland, Imagining Fatherhood in Colonial India, weaves stories of fathers and children into the history of gender, family, and nation in colonial India. As the first academic history of fatherhood in this period, it argues that fatherhood, just like newly conceived models of motherhood and mothercraft, assumed new meaning and significance in the changing society and culture of colonial India. During this time of social and political change, new norms were defined to extend the parameters of fatherhood. Fathers extended their roles beyond breadwinning to take an active part in rearing and socialization of their children. But there were differences in father's attitude toward boy and girl children. So fatherhood differed depending on the gender of the child. Most importantly, my study demonstrates how fatherhood was tied to the self-fashioning of educated Indian men and their conception of masculinity and manliness. Utilizing pedagogic literature, scientific journals, autobiographies and essays, correspondences as well, the book seeks to understand the different ways the authority and power of the father was invoked and constituted metaphorically and in everyday practices. So the map I'm showing gives you the geographical terrain of my work. This is the present day map of India, but this one you see shows the gradual British, British expansion in the subcontinent from the 18th century. So, and, the, and these dark oranges are the first areas of expansion. And then as the different shades shows that British took over, the British colonial regime started tentatively, we could say 1757, and they expanded throughout the subcontinent in the course of the 19th and 20th century. So my area of research is around here, which I will show you, you know, in the Bengal presidency and in the city of Calcutta, which is uh, uh, which was the colonial imperial capital 
until 1911. So my book, you know, set primarily in colonial Bengal with the, uh, with the capital city of uh, Calcutta as the capital. Uh, my work focuses on the upwardly mobile, upper caste, reformed Hindu professional community, broadly termed as the respectable middle class or Bhadralok, who led progressive social reforms concerning women, children, and family in 19th and 20th century India. As products of colonial education and serving British administration on different levels, these men were conversant with post-enlightenment liberal thoughts. And as modern individuals, they were instrumental in translating concepts that traversed both the non-West and the West. In their march towards modernity and progress, they creatively assimilated their Indian past and traditional practices. By historicizing two missing figures in Indian history, fathers and children from colonial India, the book recuperates the subject position of educated Indian males who were often victims of derogatory criticism by the British rulers. Ascribing fatherhood to these men, I contend that as fathers, both biological and imaginary, they assumed a moral guardianship of an incipient nation and rested their hopes and despair on the future generation. My objective is twofold, to trace the figuration of the child in multiple discourses produced by the indigenous literati, the fathers in pedagogic literature, children's magazines, scientific journals, autobiographies, essays, and correspondences, and to produce at the same time a contextualized study of the culture of fathers and children, noting its changing dimensions. So using, uh, so what is the scope? What is uh, the scope of my book? So using fatherhood in its broadest possible sense, mainly within the context of colonial Bengal, but also drawing examples beyond Bengal, my book discusses the past educated men as fathers to their own children and as metaphorical fathers of an imagined community of children of an emerging nation. The book begins with the establishment of the Calcutta School Book Society in 1817. It was the first missionary organization set up to publish textbooks and vernacular Bibles for children. And the book concludes with the prime, first prime ministership of Jawaharlal Nehru in the wake of India's liberation from British colonial rule in 1947. It explores specific moments in colonial Indian history when educated men as biological fathers, as well as literary activists and educators assumed guardianship and became agents of change. The, these main intellectuals that I study were among the first to question traditional social customs and envision new models of womanhood, family, children, nation, and I argue new ideas of fatherhood as well. This educated community took the middle class child to be the future citizen subject if male and to be the good mother and housewife if female. A close reading of the sources reveals that these male writers were also writing and asserting, uh, were also writing themselves and asserting themselves as fathers, both in their biological capacity and as moral guardians of a new nation. My work demonstrates that both children and fathers as plural and unstable categories are critical, not just for childhood and masculinity studies, but for understanding the evolving national identity of India as well. Emphasizing the connection between masculinity and fatherhood, the book claims that the study of masculinity in late colonial India remains incomplete without an examination of fathers and fatherhood. So my conversation uh, with the historiography, while I will also show you the different kinds of sources that I used. Uh, 
So the research uh, for this book made me particularly sensitive to the multiple layers of subalternity and the widening definitions of masculinity. The British colonial discourse described Indian males, and I quote, Lilliputian in size, morally depraved, weak, and feeble. In the language of the famous British law member, Thomas Babington Macaulay, the Bengalis, and I quote, were feeble even to effeminacy and were weak even to helplessness, end quote. The Bengali men were routinely identified with the frailty of women and the fatherlessness of submissive slaves. The stereotypes were further bolstered following the transfer of power to British Crown in 1858, when the recruitment of Indian Army was reorganized based on a classification of martial and non-martial communities. The response this critique generated among educated Hindu middle-class men was two-pronged. On the one hand, they had internalized the criticism, but on the other, they used this critique as a springboard to launch a challenge against the colonial regime. My work eases this moment of counteraction by the colonial elites when they articulated their messages to children through vernacular textbooks, primers, didactic texts, children's magazines, all new literary genres in the new print culture of 19th century India. The literature in my field has long deliberated on the competing notions of colonial masculinity and the way the battles between the colonizer and the colonized were fought in the public arena of debates, legislations, and associations. My work on the contrary, steers our gaze from the public debates and controversies to the more personal realms of private lives. I locate these fathers as modern subjects, as family men, whose masculinity was constituted by their intellectual and affective relationships with their children, biological and metaphorical or imaginary, rather than only via heteronormative relationships based on muscular strength and as breadwinners. Their power as social reformers emanated from their being leaders of a vulnerable community, which they, which they attempted to salvage by educating future citizens with new sense and sensibilities. Subjugated Indian men, especially the educated intelligentsia, turned the colonial critique of Indian masculinity on its head by shifting the focus from the denigration of Indians to a sharp critique of the colonial system of education. Iconic leaders such as Tagore, Gandhi, and Nehru claimed that it was colonial education that emasculated the Indians. Through selective acceptance and partial disavowal of colonial education, Indian men, men sought to reclaim themselves and their future generation. These father figures emphasized character building and fearlessness to face the onslaught of a marauding modernity and the oppressive colonial regime. They urged it was by observing filial piety, by being fearless and holding heads high that the new generations of Indian children and read boys would become ideal citizens. My work shows that the historians have missed the ways in which an alternate pedagogy advocated by the male intelligentsia challenged colonial notions of manliness and masculinity. It reveals that physical strength and public debates were not the only components of masculinity. Masculinity for Indian men manifested in practices of everyday life and it worked through inhabiting certain roles and positions contingent on relational and kinship hierarchy, caring for and commanding subaltern members and showing respect to superiors. I contend that in late colonial India, educated Indian men's quest for moral guardianship was an expression of their masculinity that poured through their emotions of affection and love disciplining and punishment 
and through a novel vision of an education of their desire. The two key themes that leaders emphasized in their primers were, and a quote from the first primer that I showed a while ago is, you know, written by this man, Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, an ardent advocate for reforms, uh, for upliftment of women's condition and also for children's education. And he said, this is what he said, pay close attention to studies when you are young. Everyone loves you when you are educated. And then he says, never disobey your parents, always follow their advice, never act otherwise. Parents will not love you if you do not listen to them. So between 1818 and 1900, no less than 50 Bengali periodicals were published for children. Between 1866 and 1899, at least 18 scientific journals were published. These periodicals or magazines or journals written in Bengali created an alternate epistemic space and addressed a wide audience of the expanding literate population. The main motto was to reform and guide the younger and the older members at the same time. And I quote, so that girls and boys can extend their knowledge as they read their, these periodicals as part of their games or even as storybooks so that the youth can put aside sensually exciting texts and take interest in useful things so that the agent can engage in serene discussion of good things. The fatherly concern exhibited by the authors for building the character of children stressed a new moral order encompassing proper training of mind and body that was crucial for building a robust national culture. In this discourse, children are gendered yet, a, yet otherwise an undifferentiated category in terms of caste, class, and religion were conceived as victims and as agents of change. The harnessing of children as enabling agents signaled a counter-hegemonic effort by the intelligentsia to articulate its autonomous space as most guard, as moral guardians of a new nation and its nebulous citizenry. Unsettling the boundaries of the home and the world, my book is a study of the multi-layered power relationship that inflected subjective identities of Indian men with relation to an imagined community of children. It tracks not so much the lives of children, but the way the ideas of a class-specific and gendered childhood were appropriated and mobilized by a hegemonic literati inhabiting a colonial state. At the heart of the discourse lay implicitly or explicitly the question of a free citizenry based on ideals of self-reliance and self-determination. Uh, the fathers I studied actively sought to frame a new nation who embodied new forms of masculinity and femininity. So these are the, the pictures I'm showing here are the ones who I drew from. These three men were very prominent uh, my, my, uh, who are you know, public figures, but also uh, had very close connection with their own families. These three women uh, I drew from their writings. So I'm showing them in context of the ego sources I discussed. So, but none of these leaders were perfect fathers or successful educators. In fact, all major leaders discussed in the book had vexed relationship with their children and often with their own fathers. Their everyday practices as biological fathers and, intergen and intergenerational relationships only disclosed their limitations, yet they harbored a global vision for the future generation. In the process of unraveling the struggle, what becomes apparent are the ambivalences and contradictions that beset the virtual fathers of modern India, a hallmark that underscore 
subjects of modernity in any other context. So now uh, I think I have five more minutes and I will go quickly through, the, through my chapters. So these are the different chapters. And what my first chapter does uh, is I use Sanskrit sources, vernacular text, secondary literature to historicize fatherhood and children from ancient India to the present. In my second chapter, uh, I scrutinize primers, manuals, children's literature, personal narratives to juxtapose the lived experiences of sons and fathers against their life as social reformers and literary activists. It highlights the contradictions that riddle the private public selves of the reformers and activists. Their everyday practices in personal life as fathers and sons did not match with their public crusade for social reforms and improvements in the lives of children and women. And there are many juicy stories involved here. Let me tell you, if someday I'll probably give a talk on this chapter, based on this chapter. The aim of this chapter is to reveal the multiple subject position of the fathers contingent on different layers of authority and subordination within family and in the public realm. For the third chapter, I draw on scientific literature produced by men uh, who were practicing medicine or other scientific profession. And it interrogates the multiple ways the child was imagined as hapless victims, as subjects of reform, as aggressors, and as perpetrators of moral and sexual crimes. At the same time, they all signified hopes for a new generation. The chapter argues that the intelligentsia conceived the child, a highly gendered category, as a new social imaginary, a concept that was developed by Charles Taylor, uh, and I put it in the context of late 19th century India. So to look into the idea and performance of fatherhood in everyday life, uh, my chapter four through six, they examine letters, memoirs, or autobiographies of men and women. In these sources, one hears the voices of children and of fathers as they define or as they defy the cultural norms. And these children are, of course, adult children. They explore the emotional landscape of love, affection, anger, disciplining, fear, and punishment displayed in the performance of fatherhood as a sign of masculinity forged within the familial, but also the colonial familial domain. The performative aspects of fatherhood were constitutive of gender specific practices of masculinity and fatherhood acted as a cornerstone of Indian patriarchy. The praxis of fatherhood enables us to document the entanglement of the history of effect with the history of power. So my chapters, uh, so this building on cumulative personal narratives uh, this chapter constructs the different facets of the modern father, the venerable, the affectionate, the ambivalent, and the disciplinarian. Chapter five and six follow the life works of three iconic public figures, Rabindranath Tagore, let me show you the picture. Rabindranath Tagore, Mohandas Gandhi, and Jawaharlal Nehru, who displayed close involvement as modern fathers at home and were also committed to greater public good that compelled them to engage with questions of education, inclusive of, but beyond their own children. They departed from the earlier pedagogical models and established their new ones for the future generation, evincing a transition from tentative considerations, contestations with the colonial government of the earlier decades to more self-confident moves constitutive of a new nation. So my hope in writing this book is to open up the categories of father and fatherhood for further interrogation and reveal the heterogeneous practices that constituted it as a specific historical moment when educated Indian men were faced under the twin pressures of colonialism and nationalism by underscoring knowledge and social identities produced at the intersection of colonial forces and native responses, my attempt was to demonstrate not only the tension of a burgeoning middle class, the stresses of unfulfilled dreams and ambitions of a fledgling na nation, but also the tangled world of prophets and humanists, nationalists and reformers that transcended 
spatial temporal boundaries of the home and the world. Thank you. Thank you. Hooray. That was awesome. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. So if you have ideas for questions brewing, pop them in the chat so we have a record so Professor Banerjee can think about them as Professor Fishman is talking maybe. And we'll hear from Professor Fishman and then talk all together. So Professor Prof <laughs> Professor Fishman, I never realized it was hard to say that, Louie, <laughs> but it is. Mm -hmm. You're muted, Louie. I am muted. Uh, I am muted I'm on the muted trap. So very good. Um, welcome everyone. I see some of my former students here. I see some of my current students here. So this is fantastic. And I see colleagues here. So it's uh, great that you uh, came out or you turned on your Zoom during this um, windy Friday afternoon. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump in to the book talk now. Um, the book actually you'll see is, uh, I can't even see myself on Zoom, which is strange. Let me move up all the way. There we go. So here is, here's the book. It's out in uh, paperback now. It actually came out a year ago. We're talking because of COVID, um, when the paperback came out, it got a new lease on life. And um, so it's great to finally have a chance to talk about it here in the department. Great, so the book is called Jews and Palestinians of the Late Ottoman Era, 1908 to 1914, Claiming the Homeland. And I'm not even gonna get into a, a discussion of how I got to that, that title, um, but it is, uh, it's a story in its own. Um, and it'll come out, of course, in, in the talk. What I will say about the, you know, the visuals and this map right here I have, um, I actually found it in Turkey on, on one of the small bookstores where it was a pocket atlas of, of Palestine. So when you look at it, you unfortunately I don't have the whole map here, but this is the district of Jerusalem. This is the district of Beirut. Right? When, I, when I teach it, um, I always like to point out here is there's a little place called Sorona. Um, Sorona today is a, 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 one of the you know, luxurious mall in Tel Aviv upscale mall, but it was really a, a settlement of Christian Templar, German Templars in the mid 19th century. Um, and, the, and, the, and their settlement remains there up until the, the 40s almost. And when you see that later on, there was actually uh, um, swastikas flying in, uh, in Palestine on their, their settlements. They were very pro, uh, some of them were pro-German. Uh, but it's interesting that Sorona is there. And Tel Aviv is not there. Of course, you have a lot of villages here that were wiped out in 1948 also. So this map, maps show you a lot and, and um, we can talk about them uh, later on in the divisions. Now, the, some of the main arguments that I talk about in the book, um, following the 1908 Young Turk Revolution, Palestinians and Jews each began to transform into political communities forming distinct local identities, which we'll talk about, and realizing the need to take concrete steps to claim the homeland. Well, that's exactly why I chose it as the title. Palestinians during this time come to see themselves as a community independent of Syria. Now I have to share with you that this is really new. Um, and a lot of people, uh, this, you know, when I set out to do the book, I thought what I was gonna say about the, the Jewish community in Palestine was controversial. But it turns out this is, this is just as controversial. The local Jewish community opts for separation from and not integration with the over Palestinian population, which I'll, I'm gonna talk more about later. And by 1914, the minority Jewish community had become an independent actor despite the growing protests of the Palestinian majority. And of course, this is all happening in the Ottoman context. Now, for historians in the room, I think this book, um, and I think uh, other historians will, will identify with this. I say this book work rewrites the history of the area within the context of the late Ottoman period and does not read history back by projecting the real realities of today back in time. So unfortunately, what I see with the Israeli history, and I've, I've uh, just finished an, another paper as an extension of the, of the book, and, I, and I'm starting to really think that, uh, you know, all we know 
about the pre-state period is that we don't know so much about it, especially the Ottoman period. And why is that? Because we look, we actually start at 1948, and then we go back to the 36 revolt, we go back to 29, then we go back to 20, and then we go back to 1917. And that way, when you go backwards, you get a very nice smooth narrative. So what I want to try to do is shake this narrative up and say that we need to rethink. So it challenges anyone that knows Israeli history, it challenges the Zionist narrative of Aliyot, mass waves of immigration, starting in the first Aliyah in 1881. We'll come back to all these points. Demonstrates that to understand the collapse of the Palestinian society in 1948, one needs, needs to or must go back to the Ottoman era, it was during this period they forged their first acts of resistance. And both Jews and Palestinians did not predict the fall of the empire. And this, this, this is a, probably one of the most crucial points. Now, during this period, I, I define in the book something called Palestinians and what I say Palestinianism. Understand it, and it understands Palestinians not through the lens of the Jewish minority. So usually most works looks at the Palestinians vis-a-vis -vis the conflict. But at that time, Palestinians were 85% of the population. Jews were 15% of the population. So I say, no, you have to look at them as an independent factor. A unique Palestinian identity emerged during the late Ottoman era, and not just as a reaction to Zionism. Another um, point we, when we look at, if we have time, at the Haram Shreef incident, it's an archaeological dig. The need to treat Palestine as independent of Syria or southern Syria. So a lot of people talk about it as being southern Syria, which I don't see until after 1917. Surreal Junubia and, and, and different, different, we could talk about that. This does not disregard the fact that they also had strong ties with Syrian Arabs. However, it was clear they lived in, in Palestine and were increasingly referring to themselves as Palestinians. And this is a poem I get from 1914. Um, that's right there in the press. And you know, you know, this idea of um, also it's just not the sort of the sort of advanced Zionist narrative or post-Zionist narrative when that there was really, there was really never ever a Palestinian people. But also the Arab narrative of saying, you know, we were one Arab people and really there was no such idea before, before the colonial powers divided the area that there was a sense of Palestinianism. So I, this is a poem, O Palestine, you have slept for so long. O Palestine, your glory is withering away, O my people. If we only knew our reality, we would weep and mourn over the loss of the land. Now, of course, when I put in brackets, these are, these are my, this is my, um, uh, interpretation of the poem. Oh, my homeland, you have fallen into the hands of the enemy. You have been plundered and are under the injustice of those who hate my land, save my homeland, my heart's very full. Now, um, I, I look at this, I'm going to go over this really quickly, and I look at and I say, well, how do we be Palestinian or, or the essence of being, being Palestinian? And I define this as what I call Palestinianism. And it acted with one's ident identification as being an Ottoman, Arab, Muslim, or Christian. So all, is, all of these identities can, can um, interact together. And of course, people transform their identities when they transform space. So if a Palestinian in, in the U.S., in Brooklyn, for example, um, during this period, um, you have Palestinians in Brooklyn, you know, it's a very... Both South America and, uh, and, and and New York and different places in America or places of migration, they might call themselves Syrian Arabs here. Um, and we know in South America they were called often Turcos because they come from the Ottoman Empire. So it understands homeland. Understanding homeland resonated at different levels: urban notables, new educated elite, village leaders, peasants, and there was an interchange of ideas. Um, by 1914. Terms like Palestinian, Palestinian, Shaba Palestine, Ahal Palestine, Palestinian people, people, Palestinian became very popular. Now, anyone in my class knows, knows this. I use this um, advertisement in the newspaper Palestine um, from Tuberg Beer. I use it as an example to say, listen, it wasn't so controversial. So the whole question of if there's Palestine or if they identified as Palestine before 1914, I say, just go down here. And besides talking, if you want a really nice cool drink in the summer months, um, you go to Yusuf Alena, who is the general distributor in Lamumi, the Palestine of Syria, in Palestine and Syria. Now remember, these are geographical uh, places. These are not, they have no, no, they don't envision an independent state during this period. 
This is during the late Ottoman period. And then I look at the stamp of the chief rabbi in Jerusalem, and we have in Hebrew, for the ones we know, our Rabbi Nuta Rashid by Eretz HaKodesh, the chief rabbi in the land, in the Holy Land. And how do they tra translate the Holy Land? They translate it in Arabic as Ahambasha, the chief rabbi, Philistine. And there we have it, a nice translation that for the Jews and the Palestinians, we're really talking about the same man. There's nothing uh, controversial about this. Interesting enough, they define um, in Arabic, in local Arabic, uh, they are called, the Jews are also called Israelis. Um, this is something before even Israel dreamed of calling themselves Israelis, or was Eretz Israel, different things. Um, but that comes from the biblical uh, children of Israel, Bani, uh, Bani Israel, but it was very popular in Palestine. Um, and now the Jewish community, this book does not define them as Palestine, Palestinian Jews, but rather refers to them as um, the Jewish community in Palestine, or better known as the Jewish Yeshuv. And I really, I, I, I've, I've uh, written now a, uh, a new article, and I just say that even the, the local Arabic population, um, Jewish Arab or Arab Jews we're talking about, even sometimes some were defining themselves, had very little relations with Palestinians, um, um, where they were able to form relations in Egypt and Baghdad and different places. In Beirut, in Palestine, it really became an issue over the homeland. There was this divide already in the Ottoman period. So this defines Palestine's, defining Palestine's Jewish community, of course, I say is a difficult task. And it's what I call a hodgepodge of communities. Ashkenazi, Sephardi, um, um, a, immigrants from Eastern Europe, Arab lands, Balkans, North Africa. Languages are Yiddish, Russian, Judeo, Judeo, Judeo Spanish, Ladino, um, a, a large part of them were speaking Spanish for the last 500 years since their expulsion from Spain. In fact, I gave a talk last night to the Sephardic Brotherhood, and I was saying that uh, my neighbors in Istanbul used to greet each other, buenos dias, como estas? And you were saying, wow, where is that from? They said, oh, we don't, we've never been to Spain, that's from 500 years ago. Because that's when I first started learning about this community. Um, and I knew about them, but it still was very impressive. Um, following the 1908 Young Cook Revolution, this hodgepodge communities of communities began to unite under the banner of adopting Hebrew as their mother tongue. And this is another myth, you know, that Hebrew was completely revived. In a, a people for speaking, yes, it was, it was very rare for, for people to speak in Hebrew. But you have numerous newspapers also in, in Poland, in, in Russia, um, in um, Eastern countries also. They knew how to read uh, Hebrew most definitely. They learned it in the Talmud Torah and they learned it in religious schools. Um, and there were three newspapers um, that turned into dailies in, in Hebrew by 1910. So this is really, you know, the imagined community is, is a Hebrew speaking community. Now, the adopting Hebrew connects Zionists and anti-Zionists alike, um, which is very important. Um, during this period, Jewish community adopts Ottoman patriotism. They don't foresee that um, it's going to, empire is going to fall. And they also, in, uh, very importantly, um, look at other non-Muslim groups, such as Armenians and Greeks, and say, saying, you know what? Let's follow the path they're taking. And if we show the Ottomans that we're loyal, we can uh, obtain measures, what I call now, I don't call my book, but now I'm calling my new work, measures of, of autonomy. They're not looking for full autonomy, but measures of autonomy. For example, having Hebrew as a first language in their schools, which they did, second language, Ottoman Turkish, third language, either Arabic or French. Now, local Zionism emerges, not just in Jerusalem, but throughout Istanbul and other places. And there was the homeland, Palestine, Eretz Israel would be the dominant language would be Hebrew, but for example, the um, Ottoman parliamentarian, um, there were five Jews elected in 1908 after the revolution. And Nisim Mazliak said, let's have Hebrew as the, the language of our kindergartens. Okay, so here in Istanbul, they're saying, let's adopt, let's leave Ladino or transform to a Turkish speaking community, keep in Ladino and bring Hebrew into as a sort of a cultural revival. 
um, in this. And this is something pretty new. The Israeli historical narrative has written out the history of, the Ottoman, of Ottoman Zionism, over focusing on the contributions of the small groups of the Second Alliance. So they, they look at groups that later became the, the, the leaders of the state. And they say, how do the leaders? So we, we basically, most of the history has been actually, including the Jewish history, has been written out by the labor, uh, labor movement in the 50s and 60s. Now, I'm not going to get into here, but what I talk about is um, that the non-Muslim populations um, are now, even though they're given equality, now they have to uh, sort of uh, juxtapose themselves vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Muslim secular elite in Istanbul. So when we talk about, I think the mistake in most works when they talk about equality as if it was across the board, I say absolutely not. It wasn't the idea that each everyone's going to have equal rights. It's everyone's going to have an equal playing field. And I think that very much helps us understand what happens to the um, non-Muslim communities later on. Now, um, yeah. Yeah, the Ottoman Jewish community, whether in Palestine is you know, in Istanbul, I always said that use non-Muslim communities as a model. And this is the Ottoman Parliament, Ottoman Armenian Parliamentarian. Very important, uh, Joe Biden, uh, who's now the president, right? I have to remember, we're historians, we don't, we don't talk about today, but President Biden last week recognized the Armenian genocide, a very important move, especially for Armenians who had their, uh, had their suffering denied. But here's a man that I work on, Barkit's bad, and I didn't quote him here. But he, he quotes, he's actually killed um, um, one of the first ones that, um, uh, remember the, let me just say about genocide, I teach him more in my Shaping the Modern World class, but uh, we're talking about, once again, measures of, 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 you know, not every genocide is alike, I have to say that. It's very important. So, um, but there was a, you know, it's remembered on our, uh, April 24th because of the people that were expelled from uh, Istanbul. Actually, not all the Armenians were expelled from Istanbul, and, and most of them continued living there. The, the, it was on the outlying areas where, that, where, where the massacres were taking place, but the intellectuals were forced to go. And one of them was this Ottoman parliament, parliamentarian member who was killed by bandits on the way um, to Ankara once he, or towards the, the center of the country when he was forced to leave. So he writes, freedom of languages, freedom of language more than anything will show the people of the empire that the Ottoman flag is the best shelter of their national freedom. And this feeling will unite everyone together and will link everyone with the greatest patriotism to the Ottoman homeland and will enlighten everyone together to love the flag and always uh, defend it. Now, I'm not gonna go, this is the breakdown. I, I look at two chapters of Palestinian history and I look at um, two uh, chapters about the Jewish community. I purposely separate them. This is going against the trend. The trend was to sort of write an integrative history. This is what I did in the first, um, in the introduction and in chapter one. But then I said, we really need to look, now, of course, what communities are in there, but I, we really need to, to separate them and look at what's going on. So uh, yeah, I'll say that this is a really interesting one. People, um, a lot of people, it's become very popular and two or three authors are writing books about it right now. But I'm in the first ones that found about this archeological dig that takes, takes place in Jerusalem in uh, 1911. It's a classic Indiana Jones story. And many people think that is the original Indiana Jones story. Um, um, what's fascinating about it is that it has nothing almost to do with Zionism whatsoever. And it was the biggest event that took place that really shook up the empire and including their worries that this would affect India and the Muslims in India. They believe that under the, the, the uh, Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, treasures were stolen that desecrated um, the Islamic site, okay? And they actually have a group from India come and visit the site to make sure that it wasn't desecrated. So this is um, really important. And it shows us that, that Palestinians are also worrying about not just Zionism, but British imperialism. Um, and they're really worried that the British are going to not over, um, take over, uh, you know, what is it today, Iraq um, and Palestine and connect India with Egypt. 
that they had already, since the 1880s, had already occupied. So I think this is, uh, it sort of connects uh, our work, uh, Professor Banerjee, in the sense that that fear of the British uh, is very, very relevant here in this. And most people haven't looked at, about it, looked at it. Why? Because we become over obsessed with the conflict that we don't look at other things that made Palestine unique or made Palestinians, Palestinians, we could argue. Now, um, yeah, so I look at chapter one, uh, chapter two, emergence of a collective Palestinian identity. This includes uh, petitions from peasants. Um, and very importantly, Palestinians always talk about them leaving Palestine. And this is something that's been completely overlooked. So they're not just worried about the migration of a large Jewish population that's going to offset the numbers, but they're very worried about the fact that Palestinians are actually leaving the land. And then it starts to make sense that, that this 15% of the population even proves a threat to their um, hegemony. Um, yeah, immigration was no, no less worried than immigration of Jews. Um, now, Palestinian voices emerged to the local press, Ottoman petitions, the Mukhtars, the village leaders, the notables from university students in Cairo and Istanbul, and politicians campaigning for parliament. This is the um, archaeological, archaeological uh, dig I had talked about. Interestingly enough, um, right as the Jewish community is looking at to build the, what's going to turn into the Hebrew University, Palestinians also are talking about a university. And I, you know, universities are universal, but here this was going to be a university for the Jewish community and Jews outside of Palestine that aren't able to go to school. Remember that in the United States, you also have quotas on Jews. In Europe, there's places that they can't go to school. So the idea was to build a Jewish university that's going to serve the community, international community as well. Palestinians at the same time say, we need to strengthen the hold over Palestine. Let's open a university in Palestine. And it's going to serve people all the way from the Arabian Peninsula, Egypt, and Istanbul also. It's very interesting. And these are two separate um, products. Now, a Palestinian Jewish community, just quickly, um, uh, we can talk about this more later. I mentioned most of this, that the language was Hebrew. Um, challenges, previous research concerning language as far as how widespread was Arabic. I wrote a whole article on that that I'll be presenting on Tuesday. Um, and it's actually published. If you're interested, I can show it to you. But um, I argue that most scholars misread um, this period um, because, because it was a hodgepodge of languages. Arabic wasn't as big as, let's say, Damascus or Cairo or other places. And I really have come to the sense that Jerusalem was almost like a suburb of Istanbul, the Jewish community was. And I don't, and I want to develop that. I want to develop that. I don't know why. Well, I know why it's a holy city and there's a direct connection between families, different things like that. But I, I really want to develop this part. There's also the Hebrew Student Union that's founded in Istanbul by no one else than David Ben-Gurion. Now, David Ben-Gurion is, uh, would become the first prime minister. But this part of his life is almost written out of history. Because the reason he's in Istanbul seems to be that he wants to be studying law. He wants to become perhaps an Ottoman parliament minister one day. And if you look at it this way, it breaks up the narrative that it was a state was inevitable. So that, that's why every, peop, every student learns, ah, David McGrail was in Istanbul. They do nothing with it. And I tried to develop and there's so much more work. And here's a, a Jewish Ottoman a soldier. He's a son of Ashkenazi immigrants and he joins the army He's uh, a proud Hebrew-speaking Jew from Palestine. It says here, Katsin Yehudiya Rishon, the first Jewish officer in the Ottoman army. He's from a place called Rehovot, uh, about, about 20 minutes from Tel Aviv today. Uh, he dies POW uh, in Russia, fighting against Russia, very interestingly enough, where his father had immigrated from. Okay, so this is, I shine light on these people. Now, the last thing uh, I'll look at is Ottoman and Zionism in Istanbul. And there was a lot of Zionist activities in Istanbul during this period. There was a newspaper network, um, and uh, they were quite active. But 
we're going to see that um, the debate over Zionism was really never over Palestine. Surprisingly enough, it was over mass migration of Jews to Ottoman Iraq. That's where um, Israel Zangville, if you know him, the, the author of The Melting Pot, was also a Jewish territorialist. And he, he believed that perhaps Mesopotamia might be the great place of freedom. Now, concluding remarks, Palestinians and Ottoman citizens adopt a civic approach to protest. Um, and this is the last time they're going to be citizens of a state they're in. Um, it's not that Palestinians never are going to reach, I think, that level of, of having representation in their own homeland. The Jewish community creates new ties with Istanbul and use other non-Muslim emerging nationalisms as an example of how to gain, gain prestige. And the landless, important trends, landless peasant class always already starts in this period. Um, only in 1936 does it completely erupt. The first attempts by Palestinians to set up organizations to buy land in the name of Palest Palestinians was also started in the pre-World War I era, although in history it's attributed to the 1930s. Um, and I end by saying the Palestinians showing desperation begin to exaggerate numbers of immigrants. I mean, there was only 80,000 Jews there, but by 1914, they're saying 300,000 Jews have immigrated to Palestine. And the Ottomans are not listening to them. The Ottoman Empire does not see the Jewish community as a threat. Um, they see them as pro-Ottomans. Um, and if they're not pro-Ottoman, they're not really that much of a, a, a threat. Um, yeah, so that's it. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, stop there. Thanks so much for listening. And um, I'll be happy to answer questions after Professor Banerjee uh, answer her questions. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. I feel so full by your talks. Thank you. Um, so pop questions into the chat for Professor Fishman while they're still fresh in your mind. And we'll take some for Professor Banerjee and then some for Professor Fishman. We'll just go back and forth. So Professor Banerjee, do you want to read from the chat? Anybody want to raise their hand, ask their question out loud, have a conversation? It'll be good. If you ask questions, uh, then you know uh, I don't miss that would make, it. That would make sense. Yeah. If I ask them, you mean? Yeah. yeah like if whoever uh, posts the questions, they yeah, can maybe someone that yeah, maybe that's on the post. They can just go ahead. Yeah, uh, they can go ahead uh, oh, and answer. Just, you know, so then maybe in the order, the order here. Then Great. I won't miss anything. Uh, Great. So Chris, uh -huh. do you want to ask your questions of Professor Banerjee? Go back to that. Hi, thank you Hi. so much. Good to see everyone. Um, let me just go back to my question. My question before was I had a sort of a twofold question. Um, and the first one was I was wondering if there was any form of dialogue between the upper class fathers and the families, domestic workers. Um, did these middle class fathers seek to teach other fathers of a different class by example um, within the context of a nationalist project? Yeah, the, the, thank you for these excellent questions. Uh, the answer to both questions is yes. Uh, my first book actually deals with your first question that you know these fathers how these fathers i did not call them fathers at that time but they were national they were reformers ideologues uh, again you know these uh, members of these educated uh, bengali predominantly hindu community although you know there are very similar echoes in the muslim community as well uh, yeah they were in dialogue and my, my my entire book is on that dialogue you know how how they perceived uh, roles of domestic workers in articulating their own identity. So uh, I, uh, in someday probably I'll be able to ex you know, explore that question one-on-one -on -one with you. Yes, because they were defining their identity uh, as ones who could employ servants, uh, which was a hallmark of this 19th century period. Prior to that, and in that book, I show different kinds of households, like European households, the aristocratic households, and the and how servant culture proliferated in the uh, 
realm of ordinary middle class households. They were educated community emerging, but they were also for your second uh, question, they also dis distanced themselves from other members of this, you know, of this bulging middle class, because mm -hmm. even the, the category of middle class, what I'm saying, which represents actually upper class is not a homogeneous unit. There are many layers uh, within the middle class. Uh, but, uh, but what, and so even in this case, the, the fathers that I deal with here, they distance themselves because one, one section of this middle-class community, actually who the British described as these dandies or babus were a very, represented a rather profligate section of the population who were, you know, taken to drinking and womanizing and all that. And, and there were lots of myths, legends about that. But the community I picked up are the ones who were also distancing things themselves from that group of, you know, what we call the middle class, meaning the professional community. All these people and this Bengali middle class, which is very similar to the uh, Victorian and Edwardian or British middle class, they're comparable because middle class is not really, not necessarily the middle income groups, but the ones who represented the professional, upwardly mobile professional community and members of lower caste groups joined as well. Uh, although I did not, uh, the book was getting so out of control, I did not include narratives of lower, uh, lower, so lower caste people, but I did cite you know, several of them to document that their narratives was not much different from the elite leaders I, I documented. Interesting, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, yeah. yeah. Professor Wills, I feel like your question could go to both speakers. Right. Um, how do you, yeah. your first question. I, I love sources, right? So <laughs> um, I was wondering um, with the case of Pro Professor Banerjee, mm -hmm. um, you beautifully laid out in your in your presentation the kinds of sources you looked at, but for you, I was I was wondering about the subjects that weave their way through the narrative and how you and and there's so much difficulty sometimes in in looking for uh, social yeah. history actors because of fragments left behind, and I'm just wondering how you chose your subjects. What led you to the particular people. And for Lou, uh, Professor Fishman, uh, thank you for your excellent talk as well. I'm really interested in those um, peasant petitions yep. and, and what you found in those petitions. Thanks. I think, you know, both Professor Fishman and I are talking about identity formations. And uh, in my case, uh, uh, actually, I will take Professor Will's question to go back to the origin story of my research and which is my favorite story. Now, uh, uh, I can make it very long, I can make it really short. But anyways, so, uh, you know, I, when I came here as a graduate student, uh, I, um, I, I was reared in the intellectual tradition of uh, Marxist historians. Marxist historiography is very, very strong in India and, uh, and the impact of E.P. Thompson uh, particularly resonated in our classes. And it was also the time, it, I'm talking about early, early 1980s, mid 80s, when it was also the time when this subaltern studies collective were emerging. So the first speaker I heard in my freshman year was Christopher Hill, okay? Yeah, yeah, India has a very, and Calcutta has a very thriving intellectual climate, I must say. Anyways, so, uh, but, from Christopher Hill, but uh, I did not understand anything of Christopher Hill, and honestly, but uh, I grew up in the uh, listening to Ranajit Guha, Parthu Chatterjee, uh, you know, Dipesh Chakraborty, and Sumit Sarkar, who defined the field of writing subaltern studies in the subcontinent. Uh, but when I came here, my first research paper uh, was on, I knew I would be pursuing women's history because women's history was not something that was in the curriculum. It was emerging at that time, but it wasn't in the curriculum, uh, university curriculum from the university I came from. I knew I would be doing women's history, but when I looked for the, and I was doing my uh, research, particularly based on primary sources, what I uh, found is there was not a single work uh, that connected the dominant and uh, 
the subordinate actors, despite the repeated insistence in those literature that the history of the subordinate cannot be, the history of the dominant cannot be read without the history of the subordinate, but there was not a single work. So my first research paper in my graduate school was uh, basically combining sources that uh, showed working class women's lives in India versus this very vast body of middle class uh, from which I come from as well. But I was dissatisfied and I went back to India and one of my professors is also a very leading member of the subaltern studies group, Professor Gautam Bhadra. He told me, Swapna, if you really want to make connections between working class and uh, elite women, you cannot find them, find that connection between jute mill workers and uh, women who are who you're studying, these Bhadra Mahilas. So you have to look at the work of domestics. Okay, you have to look at the lives of domestics. And the other person, you know, Gunja, I don't know whether she's here or not, Gunja's uncle, you know, he has a fabulous mind. He produced very little, but he's one of the star, he was a stalwart historian who inspired so many historians through generations. And I remember while we were students, he said there has no history of domestic workers in Indian historiography. So that together, I started looking into this alternate archive. So when I first went back again, you know, to do archival research, there was nothing. There was nothing, and uh, on, on in the archives. So uh, and again, Indian historians trained in European, particularly British fashion, they love archives, and nothing you know without the archives will be considered valid. But again, I was fortunate to have uh, Partha Chatterjee, who's this brilliant uh, theorist and historian, to be my mentor. And he says, "Okay, you have looked enough at archives. Look at alternate sources." That's how I moved away, you know, from conventional to unconventional sources. For my second, pro so in um, in some ways, my projects are animated by a lack, but the sec the, but the book I presented on is, it has a completely accidental birth. While working on my first book, uh, I came across in this nineteenth century sources, where uh, childhood, children. They are they constitute a major trope in those literary sources. So my first project. Uh, so I, when I went back for archival research, I was looking for how children childhood was narrativized, how they were conceptualized, and I gathered a you know bunch of sources after I came back. After I came back, I started scrutinizing the sources, and what jumped out to me are not children. There was no children in this narrative, but these authorial voices of fathers. Okay, so in some sense, you know, these uh, they, they did not claim themselves as fathers. Other than Gandhi, none of these leaders claimed themselves uh, as fathers of an imagined community or something. But as I read the sources, these these authors came out to me as fathers, and I switched my focus from children to fathers and what also and this is really all accidental this is not something i went there with a preconceived uh, notion or anything what and i had hard time you know documenting them what i also found in each of these different literary genre based study which at, at the end it turned out to be is this consistent theme of an alternate pedagogy which is very gendered which i will hopefully able to address after Professor Fishman takes his questions maybe, that they, they actually were professing an alternate curriculum, almost an alternate pedagogy, because they all opened schools or launched you know, periodicals and they were vast, where they were actually foregrounding the family. So it is outside the curriculum of the colonial schools. So a lot has been going on in the current field on curriculum in, in how children were being used, how the notion of citizenship was being articulated. But none of them, none of these literature refers to these alternate sources of pedagogy that these same men were articulating. Because these men, I showed, they were also big champions of women's 
uh, of upliftment of Indian women in 19th through 20th century. But nobody knew that they were also ardent advocates of children, that they really you know, brought out periodicals of children while in their own lives, they're full of contradictions. They had very double standards for their girl child versus their boy child. In fact, there was no girl child, you know, in the, you know, in the entire uh, uh, body of literature because girls were only looked upon as mothers and wives, more so as mothers. There, there are various terms, other uh, uh, And why were they mothers? Because they were the mothers of the future nation. Uh, which is boy, which is a boy child. And why I, I, again, infuse it with citizenry because imperialism, British colonial rule, recognized Indians as subjects, but not as citizens. So I kind of, you know, identify in this discourse, almost reading against the green, that they were articulating the identity of a citizen for these would-be children who are mostly males. What a great oh. origin story and elaboration. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Perfect. You. Yeah. Um, you know, I get to, I, I'm sort of jealous sometimes when, when, I, when I hear about your sources and then I see what we have uh, in Palestine. In fact, um, up until 1908, from the late 19th century, 1870, late 1870s onwards, there was a lot of uh, censorship Censorship was the way uh, under Abdul Hamid II. We just don't have um, newspapers even, mm -hmm. really. We don't have much to, to, to grapple with. Uh, we have a, a few memoirs here and there. We have, we have the Khaledia Library in uh, Jerusalem and different things, um, but we don't get, I think, a sense of people now. Also when dealing with, I mean, with the Jewish community, I already, I always spoke about that. It's, the sources are there, we just haven't looked at, uh, looked at them and now. Most everything's online, the newspaper, three newspapers are online, um, and you have a search engine. Now, when you don't have a search engine, you find so many more things because you find things on accident. You find that Ottoman airplane that was flying to, to Palestine that the Jewish community paid for, and it crashes halfway through, and you the sorrow of it. You find different things that you would, you find um, conflicts between uh, Muslims and Christians over the Libyan war, both Palestinians. Um, so you find different interesting things, but Overall, uh, now it's all uh, the Hebrew stuff. It's, it's amazing how much stuff we have now. And it's really changing um, that dominant narrative um, of, of the socialist Zionism, I would say. With Palestinians, and um, you had asked uh, Professor Wills about the, the Palestinian presence. With Palestinians in general, we, we, we don't also, we, have, we almost have, we have very, very little, I would say. We have newspapers and uh, through the Kurds Fellowship, Hams is working with me, and I've, I've, uh, he's going over a tedious work of, of just sitting and reading newspapers because um, I only have two eyes and I only have 24 hours a day. Um, so, so, and you find so many exciting things there, but still, you don't, you don't get um, the whole picture. What you need really is to look at the Arabic sources, look at the Hebrew sources, and then go to the Ottoman. And the Ottoman, more and more stuff is online now. I mean, just the, the, the state of the archives has changed now that everything's going online. It's much more easier. Um, before you would go to the library and the, and the newspaper is falling apart and there's no light in the basement. So they say, come back in a month. You know, it was, it was always a constant struggle um, getting sources. But now we have, I would say, the situation is much, much uh, better. Uh, with the peasant sources, I thought it was it was fascinating because um, what we do, what we see is that peasants have a a, a clear idea. Now we, we don't what we're hearing are the, the 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 notables that are among the peasants. So they they are not the lowest of the, the low on that on that social ladder, but they're still in the village and they still represent the people that and they're the families that are 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 farming the land. And you have to hear there. I mean, you know, they talk about we've been here forever from time immemorial, and and this is our land, and um, we're they're starting to, um, you know, it, it, by the way, it's 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 much less cultured. You could you could you could even talk about a borderline uh, some of the language that could be interpreted as anti-Semitic. Uh, 
I'm working on um, Ottoman anti-Semitism. This is the idea that anti-Semitism only exists under, uh, among the masses or something like that. And that would that you could also argue that this is also xenophobia or a lack of knowing or something like that. But they know very well that Lebanese um, Christians are selling this land to Jewish communities. This is this is clear, and that they have a chance that they're going to be thrown off their land. So I think that is, is something clear. We have two or three spots of uh, things that I'm going to hopefully in the future go and um, dig into them more and see because what happens when a for the, the budding historians here, you have the idea of what your book is going to be, and then you have hundreds of documents, and you say, wait, I only used 10 quotes from this one document. You don't have room to put all the stuff in the book, and a lot of, a lot of it sifted out for other projects, for students, future students, future people to do it, or to come back to it. That's what I'm currently working as. I'm really, what I'm interested in now is looking at um, I, I, I finished this article and I, and I put, I really focused on the, the Sephardic, the Arabic speaking Jews and what we call the Arab Jews. And I argue that it was, it was their experiences outside of Palestine that made them um, so, um, yeah, I would even say unique in Palestine, uh, intellectuals, um, the, whether the lives in Beirut or Cairo or Istanbul or, um, or Baghdad. So now I'm really interested. I did that as a post book article. The other thing now I'm looking at is that I'm working now that I was talking about Hamza is that I'm looking at trying to understand relations between the local Palestinians and the central government in Istanbul and trying to, to bring that out to the fore. So after I do those two things, I'm starting on, I'm embarking on a new project, hopefully by, oh, another thing that's I'm working on, the Ottoman anti Semitism also. I just presented a, a paper and that's, that's a follow-up of my book. So these are the three articles that I'm following over the book. And I'm hoping that by November, I'm gonna be finished with them. I start a whole new project. That's gonna be quite, quite uh, different that you guys will hear about uh, maybe in uh, six months if I, if, I stay on, if I stay on the track. So I hope I answered the, the question about the sources. We just don't, we don't, we, it's a, it's a constant, it's a, it's a lot of work, tedious work and a lot of hours just reading newspapers, which is really fun, right? It's like every day is a Sunday or the when you used to have Sunday papers, but uh, it gets tiring also. Thank you very much. Many of us love looking for the fragments, right? Uh, yeah, it becomes absolutely. kind of an obsession. <laughs> well, I, I always say that if uh, the police department hired us, there would be no crime left unsolved. Um, <laughs> yeah. We'd be up till three of the four in the morning, like going through and reading old newspapers and, you know, old letters and saying, we'll find it somewhere, you know what I mean? So yeah, absolutely, it's the fragments that, that make the story. Um, Swapna or, or uh, Deb Johnny, do you wanna ask your question of Professor Banerjee from the chat? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you both of you for the excellent talk. Uh, my question was to Professor Banerjee for a specific example. You talked about gendered upbringing, and then again, you talked about character building through mind and body. So, you know, obviously, um, I'd like to know what, whether you found anything interesting um, regarding, especially regarding women and, uh, you know, character building. Yeah, yeah, that's my fascinating, my most, uh, you know, uh, yeah, my most uh, intriguing question, so to say. And let me introduce uh, Debjani Banerjee. She teaches at NGIT. She's a professor of English. And we go back to our college days. You know, we went back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, we go back. To the undergrads. Undergrads, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so anyways, you know, what, uh, like Louis, uh, I have an article hopefully coming out. I don't know how long it'll take uh, that that picks up that issue of how um, uh, this gendered citizenry was created and how that was different for girls. So let me just give you some examples of how these you know how these fathers had a very very gendered view of their children, although they are modern fathers and uh, and eventually we can discern some changes, but to be more specific to the earlier period. Uh, 
and to character building. So for example, when they were talking about character building, like uh, which is like Shantane Choritra Gatur, which was the Bengali uh, idiom that was being used, they talked about the connection of mind and body. One would be surprised that we would be particularly those versed uh, in, uh, in the Western uh, uh, discourse, you would almost think that they are writing verbatim what Locke wrote in his uh, thoughts concerning education. But uh, none of, they were probably familiar with uh, Locke and Rousseau, there's no comparable text like Emil, but on the other hand, uh, but none of them invoke Locke or Rousseau in their writing. Anyway, so what they said, you know, first of all, most of these uh, journal articles actually were targeted uh, for women. You know, so uh, how to, and, and what was it, what, particularly these medical texts, medical journals, they're not texts, medical journals where uh, they were really combining the West with Eastern old traditional knowledge. That was the nature of, the culture at that time, they said, you know, how to how to handle, how to take care of a newborn, okay, or what to know about the physiology of an infant. So, um, you know, what should one of the major preoccupations of this text are diet. So, in each of these, so and they're not addressing girls, they're not addressing boys, but they were definitely writing to educate as, as I, that's why I picked up that their motto, their mission statement, where they said it, it will educate the adult and the young alike, but they were definitely geared towards women. And the only reference to a girl, to a, I will not use the word girl, girl child because a girl child is often missing in this the discourse, but they were, they were only referring to girls as mothers of the future citizen. So they know, so they know the basic physiology of how to raise a child properly. And in that context, diet comes up very heavily. And uh, in that, and it's sad kind of, and I document it from these pages of these health journals, that all the diets are meant for school going boys. And in that context, what they say is a woman is old at 20, kurite buri. And those are the kind of languages that were you know, coming out all the time. And you know, women were invoked in the context of diets as well. But, and this is something very, very deeply cultural and I have to give you a lot of context. They were invoked in the context of the diet of a widow because these medical professionals, they really celebrated the diet, the vegetarian, typically a vegetarian diet of an Indian widow. So these boys, on the one hand, they drew from the food chart of boarding schools in England, where the calories were measured out, food was distributed according to the different groups. And on the other hand, they combined with it the diet of the Indian widow. So, so a woman, you know, so a woman was only conceptualized as the mother of the nation, of the future nation. So the child, and, and you know, to, and I contrast this actually with the second chapter where I talk about the contradictions of these leaders, these three leaders I discuss and where I show the different positions, they're, they're in different layers of hierarchy within the familial system is that they were great champions of education and of women's rights, of women's uh, improvement in status in 19th century India. But they did not do anything to their own daughters or even to their wives. You know, they're, they're, these are, you know, really complicated stories. I don't want to you know, muddy the picture, but someone like Vidya Sagar, who wrote also, you know, who wrote these primers, you know, these primers were globally acclaimed. There was a clamor for these primers that he wrote, and even today we use them as I speak. Uh, and there is not a single character of a girl child. Devjani could vouch, right? In the okay. volume or, or all these writings of of Mark. Vidya Sagar, who was an ardent champion, who he was described as an ocean of compassion and empathy for women, but there's not a single girl child in his 
primers or in his other stories. So, and, and he, he actually, he was instrumental in bringing about this uh, widow remarriage act, okay. And his own, when his daughter came back home after being widowed, he did not do anything to change. He, he observed the austerity that his daughter followed, but then, you know, he, you know, it went, it fell by the wayside kind of say. We don't have any direct evidence. Uh, with this other leader, you know, Keshav Sen, and they were really global figures because both Vidya Sagar and uh, Keshav Sen, whose picture I showed, uh, Keshav Sen was believed to be the blue-dyed boy in England. You know, he was so popular. And when he gave a speech in the parliament in England, you know, the entire crowd was mesmerized. They had that, he had such a charisma and he was a reformer and had a leader of a reformist movement. But, and he was instrumental in passing the Age of Marriage Act, which raised the age of marriage for girls to 14 and 18 for boys. But in the same year, the very same year he was, he, this act was passed, he gave his daughter in marriage who was below 14. And the, and the groom was also below 18. And, and there was, and I show that story that there was a lot of pressure from the colonial government and why he did it and his justification. Although the only word he said is providence. Okay, and I, and I also use extensively from the daughter's autobiography. Uh, and how she describes her marriage. They are very protective of their father. So I have these different, you know, articles in the uh, offing, which will probably you know, come out. Uh, but these are interesting, juicy stories. And the third, third leader, I'm not even getting there. It's really juicy and it's really, you know, too complicated. Uh, but, but they dealt with those, with, they lived with those contradictions. These are real, and whenever it came to education versus marriage, marriage always took the front seat before education. So the only thing that we get from, you know, for example, Keshav Sen's daughter, this this marriage actually split an entire religious movement, mm -hmm. and he fell from grace from some of these, you know, uh, British patrons who loved him, like who celebrated him. So these, uh, so what I'm trying to also show, and that's how I ended my, my talk with that, we see these flagrant contradictions, which these quote unquote modern men inhabited uh, as modern subjects. So, and, there, and they, it runs through the book, but I wish I could bring them out more in the talk. I know that was missing, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we'll take one more question um, and then we'll we'll go ahead. I was thinking maybe of combining Salima and Hamza's questions in the chat. Um, yeah, you know, I was I was looking at Salima, Hamza, and your question. Yeah, exactly. uh, I can I can I can uh, totally combine them and, and give a pretty concise. Go for it. Short answers uh, answer to them. So uh, first of all, to, to answer you, Lauren, um, about the different interest groups and. You know, do, does this book set out the hill? Um, actually, uh, you know, when I was, I think when I was uh, uh, younger, I thought that would be more, you know, I went into this field thinking that I would like to con contribute something that, that, that causes more, you know, uh, mutual understanding between the different groups. This became uh, less and less uh, important over time. I actually, I actually uh, removed myself from activism for almost 10 years. Um, when writing this book, and I, I got much more into Turkey, also, I think that was really important. That I just didn't want to. I stayed. I stayed up. I stayed up with. Uh, I knew what was going on and stuff like that. But but I sort of wanted to just keep my distance. Um, so much so that I I almost left the left the field completely. Ended up uh, not going back. But I, I came back. I finished the book, um, and hopefully, to answer your question, hopefully I'm gonna have it translated right now. I'm, Looking Turkish translation for sure for Ottoman history and, and um, Hebrew, there could be a chance, um, and then um, most likely Arabic as well. There's been some interest. So if in the next year I can translate them to the three different languages, that's going to be, that's going to really connect to the question of Salima, which you answered, which you asked Salima about the, the different narratives, and and you you ask about um, you know how how do, what challenges did you face in pursuing these topics. The other truth, um, the, the, the challenge I faced was 
not knowing what I'm going to find out and find out and how I'm going to shape it. And I'm going to, how I'm going to, to, to put it in a way that um, it's believable um, and it's able to capture enough minds that people say, wow, this makes sense. And I think that was, that was a, that was a, a, a really, uh, that, that remained the greatest challenge. Right. Um, and it, and I, I, I think, you know, um, for the students that they don't know that, the, you know, the whole idea of dissertation of book, uh, you know, I put my dissertation down in 2007 and only started in 2013, really starting to, to work with it. I had great grants from Brooklyn College and leave and everything like that to work on it much earlier. But somehow I d it didn't. <laughs> I'm laughing about that right now, but somehow I didn't get done until much later than I thought. But I needed that time. I need that time. And, and the book is quite different because I was able to actually really start understanding what, uh, what I needed to highlight and what I needed to throw out. So, um, and a lot was thrown out in two or three chapters. Two chapters were completely redone in the last two years before I published it. So uh, that it was, it was an important thing. Now, uh, Hamza, your question, uh, is there a watershed moment where the Jewish issue pivots from wanting to be a semi-autonomous to wanting full statehood. So it's interesting, that's a, that's a great question. I think the Jewish issue about itself in Palestine um, never really foresaw um, this idea of the Zionist organization that they were going to be an independent state. They were very uh, practical, they lived uh, in the land. And remember the first, the first Zionist were very, very different type of, of Zionism, it was more uh, love the homeland and creating, um, I would say, a new Jewish people in the land. It was uh, much less uh, interested in, in uh, uh, making claim over the homeland. Uh, actually, what made what transformed this was the Young Turk Revolution, and the Young Turk Revolution brings the, the Zionist organization together with the Jewish issue because of the fact that the, the Zionist organization did not seem as much as a threat to the Ottoman Empire. Because by 1910, they're saying, you know what, we need to, you know, by 19, 1903, they offered Uganda. They say, absolutely not. We, we, we have to keep our eyes only on, on, the, on our ancient homeland. And then they, they, and then by, they see that that's not going to happen. It's really, it, they're not making any ground. Al-Bahmi II is completely uh, cold to the idea of, of allowing some kind of Jewish homeland there. But in 1908, 1909, because you have the comparison with the Armenians that are talking about autonomy and the Greeks talking about autonomy, that suddenly the Jewish community wakes up and says, well, we do have a Jewish speak a Hebrew speaking community here where the Zionist organization says, you know what? This might be enough for us. This might be exactly what we wanted. Because remember, if you go back to Theodore Herzl, he talks about an independent state, but he also gives other options. So, you know, the idea of having a Hebrew speaking community in Palestine that's uh, independent, that's speaking Hebrew, educating their children, um, then, then, it's, um, then that, that is, is the best option. Let me finish by saying that anti-Zionism during this period is very different than anti-Zionism in the post 1920s. And this goes back to the question of the narratives um, that Salima, that you had talked about. I mean, the narrative is, we read it like we're reading anti-Zionism today, and it's very, very different because the Jewish anti-Zionists during this period, for the most part, were not anti-Jewish immigration. They were, I mean, to tell, uh, and even the Hasidic Jews that are staunch anti-Zionists during this uh, certain sects within them, I'm talking about, during this period, they have a, a Hebrew paper. Um, some are saying, you know, this idea is, that they're going to live there because it's the Holy Land. For them, it doesn't matter. So Jewish immigration is good because Jewish immigration also brings children, also strengthens the community, and gives it some kind of longevity. And I think that's what we misunderstand, that we, when the chief rabbi of Turkey, of the Ottoman Empire, says, uh, says you know, uh, we want, we're anti-Zionist, he wasn't anti-Jewish immigration, and he wasn't anti-Jewish issue. So these come together in 1909 or 1910 and merge together. And that really gives them the, the, the ability to what I'd say make claim over the homeland. Thank you 
I know Richard has a question. I know Chris had an additional question. I don't want to keep you guys on Zoom so long, but if if you want to, I'm Professor Fishman and Professor Banerjee, are you game to hang out a little bit or? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Fine. So I, anyone I, that needs to leave, don't feel guilty if you have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> yes, it's been very long. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you for being here, though. Yeah. Bye, bye. Thank you. Yeah, I have a um, let's see, short question for Professor Banji. Let me see. What I'm interested in trying to understand, since you are speaking about agenda and the family, mm -hmm. I want to know while the British controlled, let me see, India 